Hey everyone, welcome back to this installment of the P2 podcast. Uh, if you've been with us for the last couple of installments, you've listened to Bryce and I go at length about just prep, bodybuilding, the things we experience as coaches, the things we want to impart on the listeners who may be considering bodybuilding, considering a prep show, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're going to do is hopefully put forth an effort to kind of put a bow on it and kind of give our both like anecdotal takeaways from our own personal experiences with bodybuilding and also working with a plethora of clients who still compete today, have competed at various levels, so on and so forth. So we're going to keep this nice and short and just kind of give you guys, you know, a bit more of a high level takeaways and, you know, we'll be anxious to hear back in on what you think. Yeah. So I you think wanna... this, is, yeah, this is going to be the episode where we just try and make ourselves as useful as possible, I think. And I wrote down some like bullet points that I felt would be extremely helpful for people to keep in mind as they are thinking about going into their next prep. And even for people who are currently in prep, like these are just good things to keep in your back pocket to remember and, you know, just principles of action that are going to define a successful prep. So for me, I'll start um, this again, just going to kind of color this. It's going to be much more related to training for me personally. Like that's where I'm going to be leaning here. Doesn't mean that anything with nutrition, supplementation, mindset is not also going to be very important. But just in terms of what we've been kind of leaning on, I think that the training side of things is probably going to be where we are going to impact the most people with like, mm -hmm. you know, useful knowledge. So the first part I wanted to bring up was I think I mentioned it in the prep episode that we did. Um, so two episodes ago, but it's so important to resist losing strength as much as you possibly can. And for as long as you possibly can through prep, ideally you would not get weaker at all. That's a perfect scenario is, is you would maintain your strength 100% from beginning of prep all the way to show day. Usually possible, probably not going to happen. Um, for a lot of reasons, but I, I think that a lot of people really fuck themselves because they have a mindset where because you're in prep, because you're getting closer to a show, that means that you can transition to training lighter and you don't have to go as heavy and you don't have to be working with, you know, higher percentages of your one rep max. And that strength loss is just a fact of prepping. And I think that that really fucks a lot of people over whenever it comes to their presentation on stage and it comes to them losing muscle mass that they did not have to lose. And because they, they chose a really shitty training strategy, they ended up presenting a poor physique and minimalizing the progress that they made and worked hard for in the off season. So big one I would say is you do not have to accept getting weaker. You should absolutely train like you're trying to stay, retain as much strength as you possibly can. Yeah, no, I mean, that's huge. And I think it also goes into just the intentional and deliberate training that happens prior. You probably find less often, at least I know I do, less often people who kind of just assume whatever prep myths lore oh yeah you're just going to get weaker that's normal you're just going to lose your cycle that's normal you're just going to these are all things that people just yeah. are told so when they happen they're, they're not there's no effort to not be there it's just oh yeah this is this this is what's supposed to happen but when you have a true ownership and intentionality behind what you do especially in the off season that typically is transferred to how you handle prep as well and you, like you said you resist those things and if they happen you can't stop it as long as you did everything you could to resist, as long as you did everything you could to take care of yourself and put yourself in position to uh, to be the best version of yourself on stage and also continue to succeed afterwards. Yeah, there's also a big aspect of this as well, where people associate heavy weights with dangerous and that causes them to think that higher reps are safer. When in reality, those two aren't correlated one-to-one -one. like lighter and safer do not mean the same thing so that's a really big issue that people run into where it's like you can do a set of three with barbell squats or you can do a set of 15 with barbell squats 
the set of 15 is much more dangerous, no matter mm -hmm. how you look at it, right? So that's just something people don't fully appreciate. And if you're six weeks out from a show, we're not going to have you doing sets of 15 barbell squats. We're also not going to have you do sets of three barbell squats, but we might have you do sets of six on a belt squat. So it's all about understanding the appropriate exercises, the appropriate application for going heavy. But as exercise selection should necessarily be changing, the way that you're training your rep schemes do not necessarily have to change in conjunction with the exercise selection. You just have to be more intentional, more strategic about what you're doing and how you're doing it. Word. Do you want to just rattle yours off since we kind of came from different perspectives and then I'll go the latter half? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. so the next one that I had was talking about as prep goes on, as you get deeper into prep, I think maybe this actually kind of correlates to what we we're just talking about, but I, I think that um, intensity is and should be much more of a deciding factor and a primal primary focus of your training rather than volume. And a lot of people get that backwards. They think that as you're going through, through your prep, as you're getting closer to your show, that means that you have to add more, you have to do more, you have to add another set, you have to add another training day. So there'll be a lot of people and we've, I'm sure seen this personally. I know I have, you know, they're 12 weeks out from the show and they're like, I'm going to add another training day. I'm going to, I'm going to bump this up to six days a week. I, I think I'm going to do, you know, glutes on an, on a sixth day, whatever that is so backwards. Like it's, it's hard to describe how backwards that thinking is, but what often sacrifices whenever you are chasing volume or, or whenever you have a volume based mindset as like, do more, do more, do more is the intensity just falls off. Right? So then you end up compounding the problem because you're doing more, but the more that you're doing ends up bringing down the average intensity level of all of your training to the point where it's barely, if at all, stimulatory. Whereas you could have done less volume, risen the average intensity across the sets that you did have and made everything more worthwhile. Also kept yourself fresher, more healthy, and honestly, out of the gym, which is very important whenever you're starting to get to those latter stages of prep, like you don't want to be in the gym for three hours a fucking day, including cardio. Like you want to make sure that you're very efficient with the time that you're in the gym. So there are a lot of factors that I would say intensity, it takes a larger and larger, larger share of importance away from volume as you get closer to your show. That also, again, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be going to failure or beyond failure on everything. There's a fine line that you have to walk and it's not intuitive for most people, which, you know, it's why having uh, an unbiased coach can be really, really helpful in these instances. Yeah, no, I mean, you said it worthwhile. I was going to say meaningful. It's funny because people chase volume, but what kind of volume, right? And lacking intensity, you, you lack meaningful volume. And if you learn how to train in a more meaningful way with better and more consistent, higher intensities, then you get more meaningful volume than you are if you just add another day, which will necessitate the intensity come down. And then you fall out of ranges of meaningfulness, right? So you actually are working against yourself and trying to get more because you're actually getting less of what matters. Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, do you want me to just keep rattling them off? I was going to do three pieced. So I don't oh, know. Yeah, if yeah. So, uh, yeah. let me see. All right, uh, this is probably gonna be a good way to wrap this up. And I think that this kind of does also um, allude to a couple of points that we've made previously, but because you have less margin for error during a prep, not even injury risk withstanding, but time, you have less margin for error in terms of the time frame that you're working within. Because you have, so supposedly you have an end date here, right? Like you're on a finite timeline. So because you have less margin for error, you do not have the ability to waste that time and waste that error margin on doing shit that is not 100% guaranteed to work for you and that you are comfortable with and that you, you know and you can predict well. But prep is not the time for experimenting. If you go into a prep and you start trying all of this new shit because you're excited to be in prep and you have this like sudden fire under you for motivation and you just want to crush everything 
you're introducing variables that do not need to be introduced during a prep. Because again, the margin for error is so low. And as you get closer to your show, as your calories come down, as your fatigue goes up, what that also does is that extends any learning curve, the neural learning curve. So most people understand that whenever you are learning something new, you're learning new exercise, you get stronger on it before you get more jacked. And a lot of that has to do with the neural adaptations. Your body gets more comfortable doing it, more coordinated going through those patterns. So then you, you can express your strength more efficiently through that pattern. And then later on comes the muscle growth, hopefully. But what happens during a prep or whenever you're in a deficit, whenever your fatigue is really high, whenever you're borderline overtraining, overreaching, is that delays the neural adaptations. And what that means for anyone in a prep is that means that it is going to be infinitely more challenging to learn new movements, new skill sets whenever you're in a deficit. So again, prep is not the time to try to learn new things. Stick with what you know, stick with what you know works for you as well. If you've been doing something for two weeks and it feels like shit and you're not getting anything out of it, don't waste a third week doing it. Just move back to something that you know works for you because you don't have the time, you don't have the margin for error to fuck around with stuff, hoping that eventually you'll get it because someone on Instagram told you that it worked great for them, you know? So that to me is so incredibly important. And then also in terms of margin for error, time deadlines, yes. Going back to the, the safety aspect, the risk, risk aspect of anything that you would be doing that you are not super comfortable with, that you don't know very well, it introduces a massive risk that you can't afford to fuck around with whenever you're in prep. So anything that you can do to make your life easier, go ahead and do. If you have to just stick with leg press, hip thrusts and split squats as your primary leg movements, lower body movements for the duration of a prep with some variety sprinkled in, in terms of tempo and modality and range of motion and sequencing, whatever, that's fine. But if you know that those movements work for you and they're not going to beat you up and you're not going to get hurt doing them and you get a lot of really positive biofeedback from those exercises, then fucking do them like do them because that is what you should be doing during a prep. You should be defaulting towards the things that you know work. So that's all I've got. Bodybuilding is boring, right? It's, it's good, <laughs> it good, be. yeah, good bodybuilders, great bodybuilders embrace the boring, like the doing of the same thing. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's a really, really old phrase for a reason. Um, so again, introducing something that's novel is has so many drawbacks, way more drawbacks than the possible uptake of you discovering some random movement that might be the new great thing for you and or you just wanting some mental freshness like both of those opportunities that you could take both of the both of those possible wins you could have are not worth the potential drawbacks the loss of time the opportunity cost and what will most likely happen is you will not be getting what you could get out of movements that you are super familiar with movements that you yep. have been doing for years so stick Prep is the time to enjoy your training it's, it's not, that sounds so mean and like so black and white, but you can optimize for different things, right? You can optimize for optimization of your training and you can optimize for enjoyment. Prep is the former. You have to go with what works and what is guaranteed to work and what is guaranteed to manage your fatigue and reduce your risk of injury and maintain your muscle mass, maintain your strength balance with your supplementation, your cardio, and all of that shit, like you have to optimize for the circumstances and context that you're in during a prep. Off season, you can shift a bit more towards enjoyment because again, the margin of error is so much more broad. Yep. So anyway, yeah, I'll let you speed run yours now. Sweet. No, I, I came from mine or came from the perspective of, for me as a coach, the X's and O's of it, like we get them, we understand them. And for the most part, we work with women who would, if we told them to walk on their hands for two hours, five days a week, they would probably do it. So cool, I guess. Uh, for me, where I find the parts where I have to kind of like lead the horses to water and like very much continue to remind and encourage or from more like mental aspect, 
the just strategic planning around, okay, why am I doing this? What am I focusing on? What mo- What is motivating me? What's keeping me disciplined? So on and so forth. So my big pieces were establish a why early and often. If you're thinking about it, if you have done it before and you want to do it again, whatever it happens to be, establish a why early and often, because unlike other sports like soccer and football and things like that, they all have their own physical risk that come with them. But the bodybuilding risks are relatively like nuanced to bodybuilding, whether they be the mental risk, right? The idea of inducing what will likely become some sort of disordered eating. Then there's also the aspect of like the the mental health. Um, I'm sorry, the major health risk, like hormonal things, so on and so forth, especially with females. You are taking on and assuming a much higher risk opportunity and you want to make sure that you want to know why you're doing this because that should gauge how risk adverse or open to risk you are if you're a person who has you know in the the point zero 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 one percent pro aspirations and you are just genetically gifted and this is what you want to do then you can probably assume a bit more risk you can do things that will put other things on the burner for for sake of winning for sake of being your best if you're just doing this for fun, one, maybe consider something else. Two, if you really do want to do this, then understand that, you know what, maybe you shouldn't, you know, hop on clean your first show. Maybe you shouldn't be doing primo after two years of just learning how to lift a dumbbell because these things have lifetime effects for you. Like this is not something you're going to do forever and you are making lifetime decisions and that's just not wise. So being aware of why you're doing something to me, the, the pinnacle of what should be prioritized before deciding this is what I want to do. This is the show I want to do. This is what I want to start to take a, you know, a more passionate interest in. Don't do it for clout. Um, don't do it for social media followers. Don't do it because you're a coach that needs shit to post. Don't do it because you went to the gym three weeks ago for the first time and someone told you that you look good and you should compete. Like, don't do that shit. Like it blows my fucking mind how many people come to us that say they want to compete, that say that they're ready to jump into a prep. And I'm like, we've talked about this before. I'm like, you don't even know how to fucking train. Like, you legitimately do not know how to train. What do you expect to happen during a prep? You're all you're going to be doing is wasting your fucking time to come in fifth at your regional show. And then go into an off season where hopefully you'll build back up to the point that you're at currently, right? Like learn how to fucking lift before you decide to compete people. Like it's really not that hard, but a big, big aspect of this is like people just need to pump the brakes on like the, the hype train Mm -hmm. with convincing people that just because they look good naturally, or just because they have a bit more glute than everyone else or just because some dude has abs just without trying like you don't have to fucking compete just because you look relatively decent better than average just enjoy your fucking life figure out if training is something that like you can do repetitively for a long time even whenever you don't want to be doing it and then after a few years three four five ten maybe give competing another thought but like if you've been lifting for six months a year you are not competing material. Just hold on to that for a bit. No, hundred percent, and especially just on the note of clout. If you've if you've ever competed, you are hot shit for like four hours. It's not worth it. It's not worth it because once you're not competing, once you're in off season, no one's tagging you, no one's reaching out to you. Like that, that shit all goes away. Sure, you make friends, but you are not gonna feel like the prince or princess you feel the day you step on stage and that is so fleeting so if that's why you're doing it uh, reconsider yeah for sure consistently check in with yourself and why you're doing something right because when you reach those high high mental fatigue levels when you reach that like brain dead operating on one brain cell and completely calorically depleted you're gonna forget why you're doing this you're gonna not want to do the hard things and you're going to wonder, wait, why am I doing this? And if you don't know very consistently, again, referencing the previous point, consistently checking in with your why and why you're doing things, it's easy to get lost. It's easy to get distracted. It's easy to not do the things you're supposed to be doing. And then you end up on stage 
all fucked up because you bench three times or because your sleep's all messed up or because you're missing training sessions or moving things around because they were boring, so on and so forth. Like consistently check in with yourself. And if at any point in time, you're like, I don't want to do this anymore. You shouldn't <laughs> like you, you should. I don't care if you are a week out. You shouldn't like you should just go ahead and call it and get back to your normal life as quickly as possible. Yeah, if you don't have the passion for it, don't waste your fucking money and time and your health. Like, like there are so many people that you can tell just having a conversation with them that like they actually don't enjoy any aspect of prepping and they're just hoping that 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 enjoyment will come from show day. And it's like, bro, it's not, it's really not <laughs> like the people that enjoy show day are the people that just love everything about this shit, right? Like if it's not for you, it's not for you. And you know, relatively early on, if it's not for you, so just don't continue doing it for no tangible reason. It's just a, it's a waste. It, all it is is a fucking waste. Last piece, bodybuilding will 100%, no matter who you are, it will change your life for the better, for the worst, most likely both. And being able to understand what comes with it, the good and the bad, like there are some really cool things, right? I think that people who want to see what their body's capable of, people who want to prove to themselves they can do something that requires a sustained amount of discipline, um, people who have that just general passion and want to just give it a bucket list drop, you know, I want to go ahead and just do this just to show myself and others that I can, you become more knowledgeable of your body and what it can do. You become more knowledgeable, hopefully, of training, of nutrition, and being more mindful of those things are usually good things because it does lead to an ability to hopefully extract and extrapolate what you've learned into normal life. Hey, I know what my body needs to run. I know what my body needs to do to grow. If I want to do a cut for a vacation, I know how to manipulate my intakes to do so in a way that is healthy. And also, with that, there's the other side of the coin. You will never look at food the same way. You'll likely never look at the gym the same way. I still, years, years, decade removed from training, from, I'm sorry, from bodybuilding, look at food in a way that is disordered. Like I still look at my body in a way that is disordered. That is a really, really important piece that for everyone to realize that this will change everything. It will change. It changes your framing. We talk all the time about how failure trains. I'm sorry, how failure should frame your training. This will frame how you look at your body forever. This will frame how you look at food forever. And that relationship, that ownership, and that very careful and intentional healing and reconciling of those certain things that pop up is very, very important for you to take seriously and to know before deciding to do something like this. Yeah. And I think that that's completely discounting the PED aspect of it too, right? Like that's not including everything related to PEDs, steroids, exogenous hormones, supplements, whatever the fuck you want to start dipping into, because there are so many other things, cosmetic things outside of just nutrition, training, cardio, tanning. Well, I guess tanning could technically be included in like the supplemental cosmetic things as well, but there's a lot of potential risk vectors for the, the negative aspects to really shine through of bodybuilding. And it's really easy to glorify and only see the, the positives, but there are a lot of negatives. There are a lot of potential downsides to I mean, not only just making it like a lifestyle, but like doing a single bodybuilding show, one single bodybuilding show, especially if you're someone who is like convinced yourself that you're going to take PEDs for the first time, you know, all of these things need to be understood within a broader framework and context. And I feel like so many people just take the narrow view of it's only one show. I'm only doing this once. And it's like, it doesn't take much more than that to like really fuck yourself up for a long time. And like, the relationship with food is, is a great example of this, right? Like you do one show and you could have disordered eating habits for the rest of your life. That is a serious consequence. And that's something that needs to be seriously considered before you make these decisions. Word. Couldn't sign off better. Thank you very much for tuning in for the 
four, five installments, four installments of us three. talking three installments, but like four three. Um, of us talking about prep and bodybuilding. And, and obviously we want to hear back from you guys. We want to hear about your experiences. If you are considering a show and you want to talk to us on a more personal level, feel free to apply. We're available. We'll make ourselves available to talk to you about any aspect of training or the mental side of things. If you want to also give our P2 on demand app a try, we have plenty of programs in there, no matter what kind of athlete you are, an aspiring bodybuilder, a lifestyle athlete, so on and so forth. Try it now for seven days. Visit the site in the, I'm pretty sure it's in the caption. Yeah, it's in the caption. Yeah, we'll put yeah, it in the caption. the caption. Check the site out and uh, let us know what you think. Talk to you soon.